a second. I'm going to assume I can see me. Um, it was invented as both an engineer's tool and a child's toy. And you will see this in the early issues of Meccano magazine that we have some posters of out there that I stuck up. So this is from the original patent. Um, and I gave a presentation at the Science Museum a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I asked, I said to people we could play patent bingo. It didn't go down too well, but guessing what these things were. Um, I'm sure Ian and Matt could look at this and tell me exactly where everything on there is. Uh, it's a crane, by the way, if you're interested, and there's some other parts. This is called a frog. I keep trying to work out why figure six is known as the frog. I'm unsure. If anyone can tell me, I will give you a number of biscuits from outside. Um, <laughs> so, um, you will be forced to eat them. You will be forced to eat them. Um, so, uh, there's, uh, the, way that, the way that Hornby envisioned this toy is he said that for the general user, it's a toy. For the person that really plays with it, it's an engineer's toy. You can use it for these real, real uh, kind of engineering uh, aspects and you can build machines out of it. And so he said, a certain, he was obsessed with ingenuity, and it comes up in all three of these, and this was all in his original patent. He said, a certain amount of study, ingenuity, or intelligence being required to fit them together so that the invention, while being a toy, is also useful as an educational device. I thought of that bag. <laughs> um, and by providing various pieces of different shapes provided with a series of holes, they can be so assembled and fastened together that a child of ordinary ingenuity can build objects without special toys. Interesting language. Um, and the last one is also various other objects can be assembled and built up by exercise of a certain amount of study and ingenuity. Consequently, the invention constitutes an education device for the young as well as the toy. Um, so Hormi was obsessed with this idea that if the more you practice with something, the better you will be at using it. That was essentially his idea. Um, so then you have the Meccano magazine. So this, that was in 1901. Meccano developed, it was Mechanics Made Easy when it was first made, and then the name changed to Meccano. And my understanding, of Meccano, and I'm going to look at you guys, is where the name Meccano came from. Do you want to say where it came from? Or it must have been the two guys that were developing the idea. They needed a catchy name, and it would be much more ideal if it was a single word, yeah. because then they can put it on the branding, and both of them had the idea that this subject that they're coming together with is going to be successful. Yeah. And of course it was, and it surprised even them how successful yes. it was so quickly. Yeah. So the name Meccano came from literally knowing mechanics. Meccano, I know mechanics. Um, and in the third issue of the magazine, and I have a, an amazing poem by this guy outside. That's um, up here, actually. Oh, it's there, sorry, it's there. Again, um, we'll read that in a second. There's no way an 11-year-old wrote that poem. If he did, <laughs> yeah, it's, claimed. it's claimed to be written by an 11-year-old in the magazine, which tells you quite a lot in itself. Um, but the way that Meccano was presented in the Meccano magazine was as a toy and as an engineer's toy. It was a consistent thing. So, you have Cobalt here, and he's 11, and so his entire letter, he wrote a huge letter in, apparently, uh, about how Meccano is a toy, and his entire point is, toy rhymes with boy very happily. No two things go so well together. Also, noise rhymes with boys. <laughs> but there is this about Meccano. It's the most silent of toys. I feel like we know who this is being aimed at, this kind of branding. You can, go working, you can go on working so quietly that people do not know that you're in the room with them, and they sometimes forget to say that it's time to go to bed. <laughs> you do not know, you are, sorry, you do not know you are learning things, but you are all the time. Not many toys do that. So, what year was that? That was 1917. Yeah. Uh, it, was very, it, was, it was a very, very long time ago, absolutely ages ago, yeah. Um, so when this was written, so Frank Hormy was the editor of the magazine at this point, and Meccano was very, very successful until about the 50s. We can get into why it is in the questions later on, because it's, it's a very, very long story to try and tell. And then another toy came out in about the 50s. Anyone want to hazard a guess what that toy yeah. was? Yeah. Lego. These guys are giving you <laughs> Lego is. If you go, I've been to the Meccano meetings, I've uh, been to a number of them, and if you say Lego in the room, Matt and Ian are great. They'll just laugh and say, yeah, Meccano's fine. There are people in that room, if you say Meccano, you just have, so if you say Lego, you just have pieces of Meccano fly past your head. We, we have a member who actually made a Lego crushing machine. <laughs> From Meccano, I'm guessing. Was, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, um, it has teeth. <laughs> but the reason Meccano was initially so successful, and it's actually interesting because you see Lego do this now, is it talks about how Lego can be used for more than just a toy. So any of you who've seen in Sainsbury's, they're doing the Lego promotions with the stickers for, for young kids. Did you guys collect those in Sainsbury's? Did you ever get those? They yeah. literally just stopped yeah. it. Okay, no worries. There's, but there's Lego, man. There's so many, you know, think of everywhere you've ever seen Lego. It's in computer games today. It's in, you know, you have Lego Land, you have all the sets, you have the Star Wars sets. It's everywhere. Lego, I think, is one of the biggest companies in the world. 
Meccano was one of the biggest companies in the world about 100 or so years ago. They, they, they peaked in the 30s, then technically the 50s, um, but they, they, their highest peak was in, in, in the 30s. So, sorry, getting back to the main point, because I'm going off on a tangent there. This is David Nash. He was in the magazine next to Cobalt. He's 14, so Cobalt was 11. David is 14. And he says that Meccano is a tool that helps engineers. So Meccano is a help to the study of engineering. Nowadays, however, hundreds of, there's no way again a 14-year-old wrote this. <laughs> Nowadays, however, hundreds and even thousands of boys have practical experience in the line of mechanical engineering. And this is the result of Meccano. The previous half of that that I've taken out on this is he said, before Meccano was invented, you had all these boys that just didn't know what to do. And they spent their days walking around going, how do I build things? I have no idea how to build things. But it's presented that Meccano is the solution. But for our sins, though, uh, we did make explosives, both of us. Yeah, we so did. Yeah. We, we, We've we had these entire conversations yeah, over lunch and dinner last, the last two days. We've been talking about um, that we were naughty boys in science at school. So we, we needed redirection. fire to buildings. And people nodding. Ben, I'm enjoying that you're nodding. Going, I did the same <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Blowing buildings so, up and setting fire to Guilty conscience. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> when you go to... No, I won't say. When you go to senior school... Um, Take chemistry, it's great. Um, <laughs> you get to blow things up, it's brilliant. I saw a thermite reaction when I was 16, which is crazy if you think about that now. Anyway, um, so thus it will be realised that the principles of Meccano are true engineering principles. This is a 14 year old, apparently, saying this. And that when a boy is enjoying himself with Meccano, he's learning something of practical use and of great importance. So you can see that you have Cobold, who is very much a toy. You have David Nash, and it's a help to his engineering skills. And then you have, unfortunately, he doesn't have a picture of the magazine, you have Hector Beard, and he says, Meccano is a help to engineering. And he says, I consider Meccano is not only an interesting and pleasant pastime, but it gives boys a splendid insight, blah, 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 whatever else he says. Um, the important thing is, that, that Hector says in his article, is that uh, he works for an engineering company. He had an apprenticeship. He's 16. He had an apprenticeship at a company. And he says, I walked in on my first day, and they asked me about some gears and some levers, and I knew it. And they said to me, how do you know so much about Meccano? Uh, how do you know so much about engineering? And he went, well, I have a set of Meccano. And the guys, the engineers that he was working with said, you are the luckiest boy that you have this set. And that's, well, they explain all of this in the magazine. Because this is all part of the marketing of saying, this is a toy and it's a tool. And I think that's one of the things that's been lost for the people in this room already who've seen the machines. I'm looking at a few of you who I know have seen it. You walk in and you'll be struck by what this thing looks like. Take a step back and think, this is a toy. This is a child's toy. Bar one or two you, pieces. You there, right? This is a child. Yeah, this is a child's toy. I'll pass this around. Please don't eat any of it, as tempting as it looks. <laughs> um, may have been to this corner of the room with it. Please don't eat any of the small parts. You guys crack on. You're over okay um, So, the, the interesting thing about being a toy is that, bar, I think, two or three pieces, mm -hmm. any of you could buy Meccano sets today. Mm -hmm. Anyone. Anyone. In this room could build it. If you have the instructions, mm -hmm. and you have the Ian's brain, you could, uh, you could build it. No, that's what we... Um, we no, that's the... Yeah, that's that's the absolutely, no, that's, 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 that's not that no, difficult. No, it, it's, it's the point that anyone could build this. Um, mm. And I think what's, what's more interesting about it as well is that... Well, actually, no, I'll, I'll, I'll say that a bit about the, the differential analyzer, um, which we're going to come on to in a second. So this is the Meccano up here. This is from the Meccano magazine. We have a number of those outside as well. Please have a look. But it's interesting that you have this... It, this is the third issue of the magazine. So it's still four pages at this point, and it's still pretty much handwritten, and it's spelling mistakes everywhere. But very early on, Meccano knew what it wanted to be. It was a toy, it was a boy's toy, and it was a man's tool, unfortunately. There were girls initially involved with Meccano, and then for various reasons, they kind of disappeared in the 1920s when various other things happened, unfortunately. But despite that, we've had a lot of conversations about the, the, uh, the female Meccano members, the women Meccano members in your clubs, who build amazing, amazing things. Yeah, there's one up here. Yep. Yeah. Meccano yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's this year. That's that's not. Yeah, that's from August. That that yeah. issue there. So we get onto the machine itself. So throughout the the twenties and thirties, there's an editor called Edison Hawks who takes over from Hornby, and he starts to change the toy, and he starts to focus it much more on. Oh, he starts to focus it much more on the real world application of the toy. What can it do? Uh, and he starts publishing. He starts putting up various different. It's not in here. We up there. He starts putting up various different articles in the magazine relating to this is a toy that you can use to build things. Here's an example. So, in 1930s, they have a, a mechanical clock that's made by Alexandre Rahm, which I think might be up there somewhere. Yes, yeah. It's a nine-foot-tall clock made from Meccano. I'm going to use Ian as an example. Actually, I'm going to crowdsource this. If you were going to build a windmill 
from a child's toy, <laughs> how big would you make that windmill? Yeah, just that banana high support, three feet, four feet. Mm -hmm. Ian, how big was yours? Well, the, the top of the tower is about there, and the sails would just about hit the ceiling, and the tower is about that diameter at the bottom. Ian, how big did you make that crane out of Meccano that you were telling us? Oh, yeah. Have yeah. a guess, how big would you make a crane out of Meccano? Yeah. How big do you think? A crane that's mounted on, on a on a, on a That's big, so that's long. again four feet. Ian, how big was it? 42 feet. Oh. <laughs> now, 42 big feet. is not everything. I'm going to... Ian's being very modest here, both the windmill and the crane work exactly as the real thing. Completely. The gearboxes, the, the, the way that the turret on the windmill operates the sails, the control of the direction of the sails, and the pitch on the sails of the windmill. The crane in every single way, the hydraulic rams come out, the steering, the engine, the drive, the crane, the everything, the telescopic jib. That the whole thing works as the real thing. Yeah, to the point, when I first tested it outside, uh, there was an old railway em embankment, an old railway line, and uh, unbeknown to me, they were replacing the bridge further down, and this crew came up and said, you've assembled the crane in the wrong place. <laughs> it's a toy, it's a toy. <laughs> and this is what's fascinating about Meccano as well, it is, is this thing that it can be mistaken in. There are examples, um, I don't have any pictures of them, but there are examples of where it's been used to build real-life bridges. It's been scaled up, and you have Meccano, that's an actual bridge that you can walk on. I believe you heard of Legoland. Yeah. Hands up if you heard of Legoland. Can anyone tell me what Meccano Land is? Anyone want to hazard a guess what Meccano Land is? It did exist, it was 1917. Have a go, what do you think? Um, it was just built out of, of Meccano. Very close. Have you guys ever been to a pantomime? Yeah. You've been to a pantomime at Christmas. So Meccano Land, yeah, you've been to a pantomime, yeah? So Meccano Land, at Christmas, they built an entire Travelling pantomime in 1917. I have a picture of it somewhere outside, out of Meccano. And they use oversized pieces of Meccano. So wherever the box is, whoever's got the box, please hold up one piece, just hold up a piece, any piece, any, I think a red piece if you can. So imagine that, about a hundred times bigger. And they were making these massive things, you'll see it in the picture, there were loads of kids in front of it, they were making these entire landscapes out of Meccano. And they did a pantomime called Babes in the Wood. I think it was a play on Robin Hood, I'm not exactly sure. But that was Meccano Land, a long time before Legoland. And I have said to Charlotte, I want to write a journal on this, from Meccano Land to Legoland, and talk about the development of toys. Maybe one day we'll get there. Hornby, sorry, I'll hurry up because I realise I'm very boring. Hornby, um, when he was made, when, when he was, thank you, I'm not boring. It's very kind of you to say. Hornby, when he was, um, this guy, he's going to get all the biscuits when he does it. Hornby, when he uh, made Meccano, sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier. Hornby spent a lot of time in a lot of articles in the magazine in the 30s before this was made saying how Samuel Smiles had been the guy who had inspired him. And that it was the work of Samuel Smiles and his... Um, if any of you know about Samuel Smiles, he wrote a lot of books around self-help, this idea yeah, that yeah. through self-improvement you can become a useful member of society, essentially. I've simplified that sort of historians and throw things at me. But essentially it's this idea that through, you know, through kind of um, self-improvement and kind of teaching yourself things, you can become a very... A, an eminent gentleman, I think is the phrase he used. And Hornby constantly went on about the influence of Smiles in, in making Meccano, and that he saw Meccano as the physical embodiment of Smiles' um, uh, uh, philosophy. So, jumping forward in time, um, there was a big change in Meccano throughout the 20s and 30s, which I very, very, very briefly touched on, and we can talk about this more outside. This is a very quick run through of things, so we can always talk further. This is Beverly's Heart Tree, uh, and this is Arthur Porter. I can, oh, she's gone. Can anyone just tap Laura, uh, Lawrence? On the iPad there, Matt, right next to your right elbow. Mm -hmm. She's disappeared off of there. Sorry, just the, the thing that's so top. just touch. Uh, no, her name is going to be top right there, I think. Uh, it will say Lawrence. Yeah, that's yep, got it. Yep. Uh, and we'll bring her back. Um, sorry for the noise that's going to make. There we go. Um, so you have, sorry, Douglas Hartree, uh, who in the First World War with his father, William Hartree, had worked on differential equations, which we will explain what they are in a second. So do not worry, I'm going to get Matt to do it. He's a much. You've said the word. Oh, no, I'm not going to say differential. Um, who is a much better explainer of this than I am. But he spent the First World War working with his father, um, hand computing these machines. So without getting too much into the history of computing, um, again, we can talk about this further outside. Before a computer, computers were people who sat and worked things out by hand. So there's a, there was a guy in 1850 called William Shanks who wanted to know the digits of pi, and pi is 3.16, 
So, um, there was a great moment earlier where I said that in front of Matt and Ian, and instinctively they both went 3.16. 2.14. I don't know, I'm a historian, we don't know this. Um, so, um, uh, so um, if it does. Shall we go eventually? It's fine. Uh, and so, this, so originally, um, I completely lost my train of thought and my lack of pot. So, William Shanks, that's it. William Shanks. He spent 23 years doing hand calculations to work out the digits of pi after the decimal point. For no reason, just for some fun, pretty much. Other reasons, but pretty much for fun. He even said, I know that there's essentially no point in me doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that was in 1850 to 1873. And it wasn't until 1946, with a desk computer, that someone worked out more digits of pi than he had by hand over 23 years. So it takes a long time to do this stuff. It takes a long, long time to do it by, by hand calculation. Unfortunately, he was wrong on one of his places, the 529th place. He'd done brilliantly for 528 places, and the 529th place, he made a mistake. It was a zero, wasn't it? Was it was a zero. So it. to work out the digits of pi, it's something called arctangent sums. Don't worry about what they are. Um, but it's a, it's a string of numbers. And he didn't make a mistake working things out. So he didn't do 2 plus 2 is 5. He made a mistake because all he had to do was transcribe a series of copy, a series of numbers from earlier in the sequence and put it later on, because it's just the way it works. And he was writing it one day, and this is what generally historians of math think happen. He was writing it, and he forgot to put a zero in. And it's a sequence of numbers, as long as you can imagine. And this one zero that he missed meant everything was wrong after that. And there's no way of knowing. He had no clue. So even if he'd realized it was wrong, no way of knowing. And it was only until 1946 when a guy called David Ferguson saw this and worked it out. He worked out with a desk computer, a desk calculator, um, uh, and it was only then that they realised there was a mistake. And it shows the, the the issue that had existed with these equations before this machine and others were invented. A, they took a long time; they were inherently inaccurate, and there were so so many problems with trying to work them out.